<laughs> well, hello, everybody, and welcome back to episode eight of the Lucas and Zach podcast. Um, it's good to be back for another week talking uh, animated Halloween films. I am here. Zach is here, of course, um, being weird with I don't know what he's doing. And we also have a wonderful special guest. It's Nazario. Hey, hey, hey. Hey, I heard of him. Yes, he has name note. He has name notoriety. Uh, thank you for having me, guys. This is kind of my thing: uh, <laughs> children's movies and horror movies. So mix them up, and you get magic. And of course, we've forgotten the most important thing, which is, of course, it's a Tim Burton movie, which means we had to have the world's largest Tim Burton fan, Nazario, on the show. But let's get this show started the way we always get it started, which is, of course, with the first movie you logged on Letterbox, Zach Ford. What's the last movie you logged on Letterbox? Um, I completely forgot everything we planned. My last uh, movie was um, Undyne. Uh, I don't think it should be pronounced that way. That might be called in different languages. Undyne. It is a German movie by the great director Christian Petzl. Um, he did the beautiful uh, movie Phoenix, one of my favorite of the past decade, um, as well as Transit, um, which is also you know great. Um, kind of escape war torn um, areas kind of movie. Um, Undyne is it's a it's a it's a hard one to talk about. It's definitely like damn sexy. Like the two leads just like walk by each other or together in a park with their like heads next to each other. And if I saw that in real life, like I would just probably have to die because there's never going to be a sexier thing I see in my life walking around the park. Um, but like plot wise, I'm I'm. I'm trying to dig through really what it what it was going for. Reading about the undyed myth, um, which is like the Little Mermaid myth almost, um, is helped fill in some of um, the blanks for me. But thematically, I just don't know if it, it it dug far enough. Can we? I am being vague. I'm reading notes and talking about it live on a podcast. Um, it is great podcasting. <laughs> talking about just try and be still and just tell you don't spoil <laughs> Undying, the movie that no one has seen. I'm not. I don't feel bad now about what the hell he's talking about because I literally have no idea what he's referring to. Hey, New York Film Festival, baby, <laughs> drop the dollar, watch some nice cool new shit. <laughs> Undyne. Hey, I like the director. I saw his film Barbara. That's pretty great. I'd like to see his other stuff, but I haven't seen this one. Nazario, what's the last movie you logged? Uh, the last one I logged before recording the show was actually 1982's Creep Show, which is uh, basically a, a homage to easy comics type of storytelling, like, you know, Vault of Horror, Tales from the Creek, those stuff. And it's uh, actually directed by George A. Romero, who's the director of A Night of the Living Dead and most of the zombie great movies ever made. Uh, but, you know, it's actually just like goofy, fun, horror, sh like stitch, skit. I forgot the word. Uh, That's the word. Shit, shit. That's it. No, it's not shit. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's the stick I was going for. But yeah, it's actually uh, very fun. It has like four or five segments overall. And none of them drag, actually. They're all pretty interesting. Uh, they have a particularly goofy performance by Stephen King in it, uh, which is amazing. It should be watched mostly uh, only because of that, if it's necessary. But uh, yeah, it's scary at times, disgusting at other times, and always fun to watch. So I really liked it. All right. A little anthology horror film. I don't think Z and Zach have seen this. because no, I want to. I guess Stephen King had a lot to do with this movie. It's kind of interesting. He's like wrote the whole screenplay. It's it's amazing. Fascinating. When we do Leslie Nielsen month. We will we'll put Creep Show <laughs> at the top of the line. He's in that movie, right? I didn't make this up. Um, we will be doing Leslie Nielsen months sometime in February of 2047. So, uh, if you stick around long enough and give us enough money, maybe you will get. The creep show oh, once outside. again, one Patreon <laughs> subscription, and I will watch Creep Show for sure. Zach is a really cheap person, and I'm trying to <laughs> make a little money out of this enterprise. Uh, Fifty thousand dollars, not a penny less. Um, the last film I logged on Letterboxd was The Corpse Bride, or Corpse Bride, um, which is another Tim Burton animated movie, and I, 
This is one of the few times in the history of the show that I've watched something that directly ties into the main film of, of the podcast. Um, but I wanted to just get like get a better grasp of the Tim Burton aesthetic. Uh, Corpse Bride is wonderful. It's a really, really fun, which is weird to say about the subject material that I call it fun, but it is. And um, has some really good songs, really good music, and then kind of the classic Tim Burton aesthetic working really effectively. And then, you know, a really good voice cast of the typical Tim Burton people you'd expect to see. Really good one. Um, yeah, if you enjoy stuff like Frank and Weenie, after this podcast, I would definitely say, you know, I think you'll probably like Corpse Bride as well. You know, for funny stuff. Uh, he actually co-directed that movie with Mike Johnson. He did, yeah. He felt a little unsure of his abilities with the stop animation format because it's actually very difficult to do. But based on the experience he learned from the Corpse Bride, then he went solo for Frank and Winnie. So, Good yeah. Thing. Little fun facts. Definitely works. Uh, but let's go ahead to our main discussion, which of course is our main feature film for the evening is Frank and Winnie. Um, just a quick programming note to everyone. We will be kind of merging our section on the main film and the section where we try to tie it into horror and monster genre overall, because I feel like, and Zach was the person who put this forward, is it's basically impossible to talk about Frank and Winnie without talking about the connections to the larger genre and the history of horror films, because clearly Tim Burton loves that stuff. But before we get into the discussion, let us start with our favorite segment, the award-winning segment Twice Emmy nominated, only won one of them. Zach Ford. Yeah, we get three do. <laughs> In a future episode, <laughs> no one knows this yet. <laughs> Zach Ford's plot summary. Um, I'm going to do great, guys. I've seen this movie five times, which does not happen often. All right. You've watched movies day of and still forgotten half the <laughs> Um <laughs> so, so there's this kid. Name? I don't know. This kid. Uh he has a dog, and he likes his dog, and he makes Just to be clear, the dog. kid's name is Victor Frankenstein. Hey, don't interrupt. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Vic, I believe he goes by. I don't know. He should. Vic uh, makes movies with his dog. He hangs out with his dog. He plays baseball because his dad pressures him to, you know, what a sport. He can like sports and science. The two things the town cares about is baseball and science fairs. So the kid has to have it all and play baseball. He builds up some confidence. He hits a home run. The dog chases the ball into the street and kills him, giving us all the lesson that baseball is bad and you shouldn't force your kids to play sports because it kills your pets. Um, that's how all my pets have died. Uh, so he tries to bring him back because science is his true love. He brings him back like Frankenstein, um, and then um, the little Igor kid that um, I don't know wants some like social cred tells everybody else that um, they were doing this for, for his science fair, and he gets him to bring you know his our dead fish alive, and then all the other people come um, to steal his like science, and they use his. Um, technology to bring all these other animals um, to life with um, drastic consequences. Uh, you got a hamster mummy, which is the best character in the movie. You got a giant Godzilla turtle. You got a cat, Dracula, bat, werewolf thing. You got uh, the monkey, sea monkey that are basically gremlins. And you get a lot of great, you know, pets turning into classic monsters. And, um, you know, of course, Frank and Weenie saves a day fighting vampire cat in the house, um, and he dies, but doesn't die. He brings him back with love, just like he did the first time, and they live happily ever after. That, uh, that is certainly the plot of Frank and Weenie. I uh, guess so I didn't I say the end, so you didn't know it was done. The end! <laughs> how, how all movies end greatly, the end. The, the <laughs> least if we lived in the 1945 world. That sounded vaguely familiar. <laughs> wow. Sounded that's like a, a movie. That sounds some serious shade. Uh, so let's start the discussion with focusing on what is kind of the main creative entity behind this film, which is, of course, Tim Burton. So Tim Burton, mostly live action, but he does the product. He's the producer on Nightmare Before Christmas, which is very much he didn't direct the film. Credit to Henry Selleck. But that is very clearly a Tim Burton aesthetic. He co-directs this one, and then, of course, he does uh, – he co-directs Corpse Bride, and then he does this one. Has not done a lot of animation, which is kind of weird, to be honest, because he seems like he fits animation. Like, his style almost he works better an for animator. animation. He was an animator yeah. for Disney. 
Oh, absolutely. <laughs> he animated uh, the fox and the hound, like part of it. But definitely his aesthetic didn't really work for for the yeah. Disney thing they were doing back then. And he actually got to explore a little bit that on shorts. He made uh, an animated short called Vincent, which mm -hmm. is actually very interesting. And that's how he actually fell like into the mood of trying to do stop animation movies because that reflects more his aesthetic, like you mentioned, that he's going for. And yes, uh, Nightmare Before Christmas is basically a Tim Burton film. He, he wrote the short story that they adapted it from. He designed all the characters that they have in the movie and the set. But yeah, like I said, he didn't trust the, his abilities with the stop motion art. So uh, also the studio didn't wanna like spend a lot of money on it without actually having somebody who actually knew what he was doing. So they got Henry Selick, who is a master of this, Coraline, for example, it's also Henry Selick film. And the guy, the guy is actually pretty great, but definitely uh, true and true, aesthetic wise, that's Tim Burton. Absolutely. Yeah, um, and, and it's almost playing off some of his tropes, which, um, like, in Edward Scissorhands, there's just that, like, colorful, bright suburbia, and he, you know, implements it with, the, you know, the dark um, Edward Scissorhands character, and this, like, says, you know, fuck the suburbia, just, like, everyone is Edward Scissorhands. This whole town is just yeah. all going to be uh, dark, temper and creatures, so it's just, like, really, if Tim Bird was able to own his own town, this is what it would become. It's all the dark gloomy yeah. um, I, I have no idea what happened when he was a kid but the man does not like suburbia he always paints them as <laughs> ignorant mob mentality type people like all those people who don't live in the city they just live in their little town over there they're not really right in the head you know zach you bring up a really good point which is that this movie differs from a lot of movies about halloween in that the main character isn't just the one kind of weird person, weirdo in the town, and everybody else kind of makes fun of them. Everyone in this movie is weird. Like, the teachers are weird, the parents are weird, all the other kids are weird. Like, the it kind of um, breaks the standard trope where it's like the one kid is different and weird, and that's like the problem with him and the reason why he's ostracized. The entire film is just about everybody being weird because, of course, Tim Burton wants to make a movie where his aesthetic works, and it would not really be a Tim Burton movie if there was a bunch of, like, normal people and then the one random weirdo because tim burton wants to just make it a tim burton world i mean in the, and because of that it's not the conflict sometimes the conflict is the weirdo being the you know fish out of water but this is he's just like an introvert by choice and that's it he's not it's not because he's weird uh, it's because he's an introvert and doesn't play baseball <laughs> did you guys notice the name of the girl who owns the white cat mr uh mr whiskers that becomes the bat you think I know the name of the girl when I couldn't name Victor Frankenstein? Come on. <laughs> the girl is literally called Weird Girl in the credits. <laughs> is she really? I did not realize that. Uh, that that's what we're name my future child as a Tim Burton fan. Weird Yikes. Girl. Yikes. But yeah, I think um, talking of character names, this movie is filled with references to classic monster movie so of course the main character is named victor frankenstein there uh, i believe the next door neighbors are there's uh, van, van helsing. helsing yeah the van helsing there's the van helsings there's the frankenstein there's igor absolutely is his name, is igor? Is his name is actually edgar igor no oh. is here with all these corrections today but yeah, so I mean, we say that this is that he loves, you know, classic monsters movies. That's what this movie is about. This is his chance to just, you know, put his love for classic monster movies on display to play with it. It's almost like a satire in a way, although it takes it serious or parody, not satire. It's almost a parody of monster movies, but taken seriously because it's taking, you know, all these universal monsters and turn them into pets. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, so instead of like the classic mummy, you get a little hamster um, that walks around and just goes Rah! And with his like straps of paper just kind of hanging off of him. Um, but I mean, out of it is handled with you know such love and such care. It's not handled as a joke. But I actually enjoy a lot the the sea monkeys because they're kind of like uh, merman type creatures. 
and they're like really like funny and and and, and jokey and fast. They actually act a little bit like gremlins too, which is interesting. That's just what I assumed the direct comparison was was, was more like a gremlin or um, other animals. I can't think of their names. Um, because they all have a direct comparison. I do just want to go back. I'm going to, every time someone speaks, I'm going to bring it back to the mummy hamster. This is how the show is going to go. Um, but I, yeah, what I really like about this is like, they carry that joke for so long. Cause, cause uh, the guy who's like the big mastermind behind the evil plan to bring all these animals back. And he's like so excited about getting Colossus and he has a gigantic gravestone for Colossus. And then he comes out as this little Hampton. And you're like, ha ha, like no one's, it's gonna be this is big, but they still like own it for like three more scenes because the the, the Frankenstein like, character still like uh, or he's not Frankenstein, he just looks like Frankenstein. Um, but he uh, like still has like such faith that this hamster is gonna like be the one to fight the turtle and, and it's gonna be like is the scariest, most dominant. Like this guy thinks his hamster is a shit, and it takes until he gets squashed by the, the turtle for him to go, oh yeah, maybe it's just a tiny <laughs> little hamster. And I, I love that bit. It's a great bit. Absolutely. I mean, this movie goes so far as to almost directly um, copy the the return of Frankenstein's monster, and up to the insertion of screws in the neck and the electricity. Mm -hmm. Like that is like there are some very like you could have done a lot of if if Tim Burton did not want to almost directly reference the original classic monster Universal films, he could have done so. But he very clearly wants to make that reference. This movie is just full of homages to classic monster lore. That scene especially is almost with, identical. Yeah. Especially with the Frankenstein thing. I love the part when uh, the dog, just like the, the next door neighbor's dog is a black poodle. She just comes like sniffing around him with a big poodle hair. And when they touch noses and she gets some of the shocking electricity, then she gets, bam, the white streaks. And it's just instantly the bride of Frankenstein. That part pisses me off because that's when I think they're setting up for a sequel and we're going to have Bride of Frankenweenie and, and there's no Bride of Frankenweenie. So you just misled <laughs> me. Um, I, don't know, I really like that joke. And I also like the, the fact where the way he animates, and I think the black and white especially brings this out a lot, is mm -hmm. that uh, when he the dog is back from the dead and he's full with electricity, you can see the electricity crackling in the white of his eyes. When the lights go down, like his eyes keep like a little bright. I, I really like that little touch because it feels like very specific. I don't know. I, I really like it. The whole scene of the the Frankenstein scene, which is identical to you know the original scene for the most part, bringing back Frankenweenie. The only difference is it's a dog on the bed. Uh, but I feel like that was his like chance to shine animation style. The like designs of the the set are so beautiful and so intricate. Um, the lighting, yeah, as Bizarro was just mentioning, it is pretty striking and stunning, and and balances um, that difficult balance between like scary and gothy to just like plain beautiful like objectively just like a pretty sight which is hard to do with dark gothic things it's not everybody's taste i feel like lucas is writing a report during this project <laughs> this might be this might be the end of his podcast he's studying for his finals over here no i got stuck trying to figure out if, uh, if franken when you sequel exists um there is an imdb page but it looks like somebody made it like it's not an actual official one I do want to talk about, um, I think Sparky's death is like a really important moment in this movie. Yeah. Because. The first death. It, it comes, yes, right. the first death. The actual one that kind of instigates um, all the future action. Because it's simultaneously the catalyst for all of his actions throughout the film. It kind of starts him down the path of this, um, you know, bringing, pe bringing animals back from the dead. But also is this moment that like, I think is very, it makes you empathize with the character. And really like understand him because we all understand i think everyone watching this movie can be like i understand what it's like to have a pet what that relationship is like with a pet and then also understand how terrible it would be to lose the pet so suddenly but also simultaneously feel guilty because if you hadn't been playing baseball and hadn't hit that home run maybe the dog doesn't run into the road and get hit by the car and i think it's just such an important moment because it makes you really empathize with the main character but also obviously sets off the entire story and, but I think if they had had the dog die in a different way, like you could have had the dog die of old age. But I think if you do that, the dog is – it just doesn't mean the same thing because you need the, you need to understand the trauma from the main character's perspective so you can then empathize and understand why he is doing the things he's doing. Even if at some moments you're like, why are you 
bringing your pet back. That's a terrible idea. But you, the empathy kind of allows you to go with him for the rest of the film. It, it makes it more excusable. The sadness makes it more excusable. If it was an old age, it would be like, you need to learn that, like, death is part of life and you have to kind of get over it. But because it was a sudden event, um, it makes it, yeah, more empathetic for his decision. I actually feel like I think it's a little improvement over the original. I I, well, I guess you guys know that the original is a 35, 25 minutes short that Tim Burton directed live action in the 80s. Uh, in the original, he's not even in a baseball game. He's just sitting in his, the front of his house throwing the ball yeah. to the dog at the street, which is very reckless. And then uh, one of the throws just goes too far and the, the dog gets run over by a car. And I think it's the mix of having some guilt about what that he indirectly caused the death of Sparky, plus the fact that he has this brand new uh, science teacher who actually like knows a lot of science and is showing him how muscles can still function after the body is deceased because you only need the electric impulses to move it, that he gets the whole idea to, you know what, I can use science and I can alleviate my guilt and bring my dog back because, you know, I love my dog, which is as simple as it gets with a reason or a motivation, <laughs> something stupid, you know, like make it a zombie. I think what is the most moving part to me in connecting that idea is that him using the science to bring back Sparky is, a, is encouraging the idea that science is connected to our passions and our sincerity and our curiosity. Because there's the line where the teacher said, when the other experiments go bad, and the science teacher talks to him, he says, you know, did you love your first exper experiment? And he's like, yes, like I loved my dog and I really cared about what I was doing. and was passionate about what I was trying to create. He said, that's why it turned out well. And then because he didn't love, because he was doing it for, you know, less sincere means, the other science projects, that's why it came out bad, which kind of goes with this idea that, you know, science in its, you know, purest form has that magic, but once science is used for any ill God reasons or capitalism or something else, it loses that that magic, um, then that's where the consequences can go awry. But I, mm. I feel like that thematically was the most resonant aspect to me. I just like to say for the resident scientists in the audience that um, love is not a variable in a science experiment that you can control. Hey, he was still dead <laughs> until he hugged him close to his heart and love brought him back. This movie is fake, weird pseudoscience. So I reject this claim about but it also love being a variable. cares so much about science. Like it's, no, it's it not going to, it's not going to, you know, do the most intel intellectual version of science that the kids are not going to understand. It dumbs it down because you just it uses what it needs to use to make you understand what's happening, while still being able to live the thematic purpose of you know science is important. Um, which is like at first I want to feel like this movie is about grief, but I feel like once it takes that spin on on how that grief and love affected his scientific ambitions, where the whole town is so you know, anti-science and they had that stubbornness to, you know, um, be scared of the professor because they're talking about things they don't know, which is, you know, really relevant to everything we're going through. That's been that, that the value of science and curiosity and, you know, digging for new truths, it, it becomes very important. I would say that I think it's a very subtle, but uh, subtle way to send your message to kids because yes, Basically, they're using love as the way to transmit the idea that when you do an experiment as a scientist, if you care for the experiment, you actually pay more attention to what you're doing and you have noble reasons and then you made your best yeah. effort. If you're just doing it to get it over with, you probably didn't put enough care on it and you may have made a mistake, which is, I think, what actually happens. I'm not saying the science is, is, is going to be... <laughs> Seriously, it's not like I'm gonna go and try to revive a puppy with a with a lightning. But if I didn't care enough to pay attention to the process of what I was doing, obviously the result is gonna go all right, right? Yeah, yeah. The love is the motivation. It's not like you kiss your experiment and that's what makes it go. It's about having the proper motivation. Yeah. Please do not. You're kiss right. Any I'm right. Lucas is dumb in a cynical <laughs> heart and needs to have his um, science approved by um, Neil deGrasse Tyson before he'll watch the movie. I do <laughs> think, though, I do think 
I do think that there is a there is a message that is very um, poignant for today's times in the idea that Victor is doing science along with the teacher in kind of just the quest for knowledge and the pursuit of you know just enlightenment and you know greater understanding while it's and it's not necessarily for personal gain like he tries to bring the dog back but there's also part of that that is looking for knowledge and then in line with that in kind of playing into very much today's political and social climate the other kids in the movie are basically like hey what can your science do for me to make me look good and that's when the science starts to fail because it comes becomes subverted by other people's um interests and wants rather than just being yeah. something like you were talking about which is that's pure in the beginning but they also interesting without understanding why they're the process is the process they just want to have the the end part and they Absolutely. don't care about the process which makes them be sloppy with the process What's interesting too, and in how this theme connects to you know this movie as homage, is that that is slightly how he is modernizing and playing off the classic Universal Monster themes, which is a lot of them are like pretty anti-science in a way. That is like the Invisible Man, or like Doctor Jekyll and Mister Hyde, which I know is also you know a book, but also still a classic monster movie. Those are like when science when you get too greedy and go for things outside of you know the human norm. Um, turn you into monsters and you become horrible humans. And this is, you know, spinning that on its head and saying, you know, we shouldn't be scared of science. Science doesn't create the monsters. That's the, you know, avoidance of um, the unfamiliar, that, which is temperance number one thing. The fear of the unfamiliar um, is really where the, the true monsters lie. And it does it in a lot more intelligent way than Adam's family, which does that in the dumbest way. I feel like I mentioned Adam's family in every episode um, just to talk about how trashy it is. <laughs> Um, I have a couple of weird thoughts I'm going to bring up. Um, first off, is Sparky decomposing? And is that why his ear falls off? It's kind of a, kind of a morbid thing. I think, take, so. I, but, think uh, I think, I think you're allowed to believe that they want, he wanted to add a little bit of like body horror. You do think though, about the, you do think about it. If they have to keep recharging this pet with electricity to keep him energized, this is this is not going to end well. Like we saw the good part of Frank and Weenie. We did not see the part of Frank and Weenie where the dog just fell apart. Like that that the really morbid twenty minutes after the end of this movie is the part that you didn't make because it would terrify all children. Actually, I do think he may be rotting away because he has a lot of issue with flies. Um, yeah. They they go around him and he, he sometimes tries to eat them and they just escape his body through the seams, which is also a, another weird. I mean, I know it's they did it because they are doing a homage to Frankenstein's monster, but he had the whole dog. Why did he stitch up parts like of other dogs in it? Like you can tell, like the back of the dog is not Sparky's back. That is a spotted dog back. So. I don't know if like some part of the body was damaged during the car, the, the when the car ran him over or something, and he needed to get like extra pieces. But it's always it's something weird. that I felt. Or it was if for believing he's decomposing, that part of his body could have looked pretty like rotten, and they could have replaced it. But this does bring up the extra question, though, which is that is Victor grave robbing other dogs' parts when he also digs up Sparky? Are they all his dogs? And this is his 10th dog to die by a home run baseball chasing. Yikes. <laughs> there are some weird moments where it's like, why does he have stitching in certain areas that don't make any sense? Also, hey, I can tell you why. Because it looks fucking cool. Show your are, we supposed to believe, are we supposed to believe that, like, <laughs> the dog's head got cut off when it got run over or something? Like, the damage on the body that needs to be stitched up seems kind of extreme for a pet hit by a car. I feel like he was just going for aesthetic design. I feel yeah. like Richard Frank was, you know what looks cool? Stitches. I'm going to put stitches there like tats. Okay, he was just going for design. Not to burn. Victor was. This was his choice. The real character. Oh, no, of course. I don't think I don't think there was actually like thoughts about like which pet. I'm just being I'm just being a, a jerk right now and pointing out the dog would be rotting and why is it four dogs or something. And um, The other weird thing is, let's talk about foresight by cat turd. Which is just a bizarre moment in this movie where the the weird girl is like predicting people's fate using cat turds, which is just a truly it's a truly Tim Burton thing. Like only Tim Burton would be like, "I'm going to do this as an idea." See, just... I, I kind of disagree on that because 
That is literally the my the worst part of the film for me. The worst yeah. part. Just showed up to him with a V-shaped turd. <laughs> and just like the cat pooped a V, so that means something important is happening to you. And he does, the, you know, like the logical thing, and ask her like, "Did you get out of that of the kitty litter box?" And she's like, "Well, the other day he pooped a V, and the other day he pooped a T." I just think like, that does doesn't seem right. Yeah, actually, I need, I need the whole. I need more than two examples for this to be like a true thing. Like, don't get two that kind of look like letters and say my cat tell the future. I need like a long list. I need like twelve examples of how your cat tell the future before I believe at all this is true. I think the important thing is if anybody comes up to you holding a cat shirt in the shape of a letter, run as fast as you can hey, in the other direction. This is how me and Sarah met. <laughs> Yes. Is that just Did a you bring in the new you bring you a Z? Was it a Z? He, she brought you a Z? I brought a Z and an S and a plus sign. And like, look where I'm meant to be. <laughs> so you can't call out a lot of cat <laughs> Also, I got Zach, has just cats. Got, Zach has just gotten divorced on this episode. <laughs> I'm telling that story. Uh, by the way, update, this is for Lucas, we're going to get Sarah on the show. So if we get two Patreon subscribers, um, <laughs> my wife will come on. Um, I told her two minutes, and she went, two minutes, that's a lot. So we'll see. <laughs> uh, tell her, if we do two minutes, I will do a, a minute and a half introduction. Okay. And um, that, that'll make it happen. Fair. Yeah. Um, my final thing I wanted to talk about, which is... This cast is kind of classic Tim Burton. You have just a bunch of people that have appeared in Tim Burton movies. Uh, Martin Landau, Catherine well, O'Hare. Great. I, he, he's one of the few. Well, guys, he's the best one, I think. He, he's actually one of the few that only does the one voice. But yes, he's teacher, right? so good as the teacher. I'm not even going to try to pronounce his last name because, I mean, that, that's just going to be embarrassing to myself. But, that's uh, that's the dance they do in Adam's family. <laughs> no, that's the mazurka. The mazurka. <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> he's so good in this movie. And he this is the first, this was the first movie he made with Tim Burton in over 10 years. Because before this one, it was Sleepy Hollow in 99. And everybody was like, mm, maybe he didn't like the he didn't want to use him anymore. But no, I mean he brought him back for this important role for this movie, and he just knocked it out of the park. The part when he just goes into the into the teacher's uh, meeting with the parents, and they say, like, can you defend yourself? You're a menace. And he's like, I don't know. Maybe you don't understand. Maybe because you're ignorant. <laughs> Everybody's like, what? Oh, maybe I didn't express myself. I mean, stupid. You're stupid. You do not know about science, so you fear it. You think it's magic. I mean, that fucking scene is brilliant. Definitely the fun it's the funniest scene in the movie. <laughs> I think that's something that you going to lay off, and he just, like, doubles down. You're, you're just like, you're, you're stupid. And just with like such sincerity, like he just like he doesn't mean it as an insult. He's just like telling you guys, like this is what's up. This is the truth. Yeah, you guys know. Um, just... Catherine Hara always wanted to hear her. Always. She do much, every still... time he every time he can, he brings Catherine O'Hara back. This is great. Yeah, she's the best Emmy winner, Catherine O'Hara. Um, should be an epic movie. Um, I want to get into what I think is um. I it's, I fucking love Frank and Rainey. Uh, I will watch it every year. But my my biggest issue, I feel like they 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 could have been a little braver in how they treated the ending. Frank and Rainey should have stayed dead. Saying it now, they they keep it long enough. He should have stayed dead. It would have been more complex as far as the message of grief. I think um, it would have been a little more emotional in a way because it's really then impacting the idea that you know you need to let things go and you need to, like that de death is part of your life um without it being kind of the anti-science like bringing things back i feel like they earned the science thing because it because i can see you saying if they killed off the dog then it's like you shouldn't you know mess with um you know nature which is not the point of the movie but i feel like they already earned why it was okay for frank and Reed to be back but now it's time for him to also just learn that emotionally you need to be able to let go but they bring him back i think just because it's like a kid's movie and they want him to have you know a joyful ending and they, they get to live together forever but i think it, it would have been so much more impactful if they took the chance and let him deal with the second death and that and finally i, I think i disagree a bit on the reasoning because i actually 
went back and watched the short because I mm -hmm. was convinced that the, the ending was different. But the whole sequence with the, them using the batteries of the cars, like jump starting the dog after the burning uh, windmill, that is also in the short. So yeah. he basically, that was good. Yeah. So he basically was sticking to what he already had done. If it was up to me, I agree with you with the fact that uh, he needed to learn about letting go. He needed to learn about grief as part of uh, as part of growing up. Honestly, that's uh, even if it sounds bad, that's why most parents get pets for their kids because they know they'll eventually die and they can use that as a as a teaching method for to speak about that. But I think there was a middle ground that got, got unexplored here because he could have believed that the dog was dead. Like the, the windmill burns down, they never find the body and he just moves on with his life and he learns to grieve for his dog Sparky. And then they just can show you that the dog survived and he's living happily, whatever, uh, like, you know, Frankenstein's monster away from the town and just, you know, exploring what's like his new life he has. That way you get the kids to under to like be happy because the ending is not a dead dog, but you get also Victor learning, you know, a valuable life lesson. You know it would be real great, and we're just gonna both rewrite Frank and Rini. If the, he stays alive, Boom. they get to they get to enjoy their life together, and it does like a montage, and you get to see them live a nice, long, happy life together all the way until the end, where it's just it's Frank and Rini's time, just from age, and then you get to see them like have to let go. So then you're really taking the idea that you know death has its time, so they still get to you know have the joy, but you know. Ha have to also learn to let go. Just like the up montage, but at the end of the movie. <laughs> I do think there actually is some value if you let the end of the movie be you brought back Frank and Winnie once, and it calls all this stuff, but also maybe, like, a, a commentary almost on both loss, but also, like, the idea that you can't fight against loss. You have to figure out how to deal with it and accept it and come to grips with it in a way that you can't just keep bringing your pet back. I, I think it's always the message of you did this, you brought the pet back once and it caused all this, all this bad stuff. I think in some ways it would have been kind of powerful if at the end of the film, they were just like, you wanted to bring the dog back, but sometimes even just wanting something doesn't, help your I mean I think it's kind of back in some ways to the science experiment like even what if you what if you love the dog so much you wanted to bring it back a second time but it still didn't work and the idea that you know just a, like a more complex idea of um you can really love something and want something to happen but it doesn't necessarily mean that's going to happen because at the end of the day sometimes things happen for a reason and sometimes you can't always get um the perfect outcome that you're trying for and I do think the town helping out with the you know barriers of the car is also pretty thematically important because that does show where they're starting to you know embrace the science and it's when they learn to get over their own fears as a town or something new. But I think they can do that. They can attempt without succeeding, and it would still have the same power. I think they can try to bring them back and, and not bring. That, them back. That's a good point because in not every not every town in Tim Burton movies gets a redeeming one, a like redeeming moment, yeah. and they actually get one on here. So that's good. I think the only pretty redeemable character is the mayor. The other, the rest of the people are just dumb. No, I mean the parents. They're always like well, half on his side. His parents. his parents. I don't count his parents as part of the of the people, like because you know that's his family core, and they're all pretty much into like, you know, normal stuff, science, like baseball and science fairs. Boom. That's it. Do you know what the biggest problem with the original one is? After you explained how he originally died, is that you're telling me that town didn't even love baseball? That, that sounds like an undeveloped story to me. I need that town to have. <laughs> That's <laughs> why it was so for minutes instead of being you know, an hour forty. Actually, uh, the first this is the thing that I have been having to like adapt myself to because i love the original short so much that that's all i actually really wanted so when i the first time i watched frank and winnie in theaters in 2011 i really didn't dig the part about the other kids and the other pets and all the monsters homages because i just felt like ah this is not what i wanted and it's it's not getting to the point i wanted to get fast enough but after rewatching it you know that's just delightful the guy just goes full in to 
everything that he really, really loves about classic uh, universal horror movies. And he does these little things everywhere in just, just the shape of the Nassim guy who looks like uh, Frankenstein and then he falls into the thing like the mummy. And, you know, the Igor kid that is basically Igor. And even the, the fat kid is kind of a homage to an, a character he made in The Nightmare Before Christmas, which it actually brings it all full circle. So even though I didn't love it at the beginning, every time I watch it, I just love it a little bit more. It's actually kind of brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. Igor I mean, I, by the way, is my favorite book for its performance. Actually, I love the kid Dwight Igor because I feel like that can easily be done bad. Like, I, once again, going to keep referencing a show that we haven't actually aired yet, but like Nick Kroll doing, um, um, what's his face? Oh my God. Um, yeah, like, Whatever. Fester. The character is Fester. Fester. Thank you. I was going to say Fenster. And I just wasn't going to embarrass myself like that until I explained that I was going to say Fenster. But that that was like so over the top that I feel like those kind of, you know, very kind of goofy, you know, horror characters like that could be done so badly that I feel like Igor is one of those that can be done so exaggerated. But this kid just kind of owns it and his voice is great. The laugh is great. And I, I don't know, that, that performance worked well. I think I know that kid for somewhere, but I'm not sure. Uh, is, that who, is that who does it? Yeah, he was in um, the the middle. Isn't that him? Oh the yeah, kid. that that's where I know that kid from. Shout out to Atticus Schaefer, the person we've just been talking about without mentioning his name. Yeah, uh, quite. Oh, hey, great performance, Ed. Yeah, he's he's very good. Uh, gentlemen, uh, any more final thoughts on Frankenweenie? I would say that it's one of the probably the best uh, Halloween horror has slash horror team children's movies around. So it's kind of a perfect thing to show like you were watch with your kid. My kid is four years old and he joined me to watch it for the first time today. And the guy loved it. He got scared a bit. Uh, there were some scenes that actually were a little scary, especially like, for example, when the Mr. Whiskers transforms into a, you know, a vampire for the first time. He, he got a little scared. He grabbed my arm real hard, but uh, when the movie ended, he was smiling and he told me, this movie was great, Dad. I was like, yeah, it was. He's like, can I watch it again immediately? I was like, no. I'm real jealous that your son knows what's happening when the movie is playing. <laughs> um, I want to use this time um, to, because we didn't do our sponsor of the day. Today we were sponsored by um, my own personal letterbox review of Frankenweenie sponsored the show. Um, this is what I refer to as Frankenweenie season, not because I just watched Frankenweenie, because this is where I just get like random likes on a six year old review, like every day on my Frankenweenie <laughs> review. So please go to my page, add to my Frankenweenie account, um, just for the sake of the bit. Um, Actually, you can wait till next year so we can continue Frank and Reese season every year. Um, it's not even that good of a review, but also great fucking movie. It's I watch, I do watch every year. Um, so, and I think it's I'm looking at people's letterbox, you know, ratings for it. Like me and Desire are like the biggest fans of Frank and Weenie in the whole letterbox community. Uh, and I really want people to give it a second chance because I think people might have given it a first chance. But please, you know, watch again at home. I think it's a really good home watch. Um, a good family watch, so give it a chance. It's great. Definitely got better on new watch for me, I will say that. I think I'd seen it for the first time in January or February of this year, and then I watched it again, and I, you know, there's a lot, I think there's more stuff you start picking up when you start seeing all the details that Tim Burton has filled his universe with, and like all the love of his his original monsters and all the classic horror bits. Um, but I think this concludes our episode on Frank and Winnie. Uh, thank you so much for coming on, Nazario, and talking about uh, the man... Tim Burton, a guy I know you uh, share a deep and profound affection for. And I know you love this movie. Yep. I know Zach also loves this movie. I am the, I'm like, I think I gave it like four stars or something. And I think I am the lowest rated person on this panel, which is kind of crazy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yes. So uh, thank you so much for listening to our episode on Frank and Weenie. Come back next week for our final episode in the animated Halloween month, where you finally get to hear us actually talk about Adam's family, the thing that Zach has been referencing in basically <laughs> episode, up until now. I, I can't wait for us to be like 10 weeks ahead in shows, and I'm going to start referencing jokes we make in January episodes in November. <laughs> Zach, Zach is, is not good at timelines. But uh, with that, <laughs> please come back and listen to the final episode next week of our second month. 
we're almost through two months. That's kind of crazy. And so thank you to everybody who's been along for the ride. And we will see you next week when we talk Adam's family.